Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to co-present today's program with California African American Museum as a complement to the Fowler's current exhibition, Photo Cameroon, Studio Portraiture, 1970 to 1990s. We are proud to welcome photographer Kennedy Carter and curator Taylor Renee Aldrich for a program that will explore Carter's recent series, Flexing New Realm, which features portraits of friends in historically inspired costumes and poses. Carter's work will then serve as a catalyst for a conversation about photography as a device for Black people to self-image and the ways in which Black Americans use their artworks to communicate ideas of Blackness and its relationship to wealth power, respect, and belonging. Before we get going, a little bit about our esteemed guests. Kennedy Carter is a native of Durham, North Carolina. She is a fine art and editorial photographer with a primary focus on Black subjects. Her work highlights the aesthetic and socio-political aspects of Blackness, as well as the overlooked beauties of the Black experience. In 2020, Carter became the youngest photographer to shoot the cover of British Vogue, for which she photographed Beyonce. Also in 2020, her first solo exhibit was hosted by the Contemporary Art Museum in Raleigh. Features about Carter's work and illustrious career have been presented by W Magazine, BBC Real, Good Morning America, and Access Hollywood. Taylor Renee Aldridge is the visual arts curator and program manager at the California African American Museum, also known as CAM. Prior to this position, she worked as a writer and independent curator in Detroit, Michigan. In 2015, she founded Arts Black, a journal, is a journal of art criticism focused on Black perspectives. Her writing has appeared in Art Forum, the, the Art Newspaper, Art 21, Art News, Freeze, and Harper's Bazaar. Aldridge earned her MLA from Harvard University with a concentration in museum studies and her BA from Howard University with a concentration in art history. If you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen for consideration to be answered at the end of the program. All right, that's all for me. Over to you, Kennedy and, and Taylor. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Bianca. Um, and thank you to Ivy and the UCLA team for having us today. It's quite a pleasure to be here with you, Kennedy. Um, thank you for your time and for your work. Um, I really admire the ways in which you show up in this field. That's such a young age, early in your career, and so I'm really thankful to be um, in this program with you today. Um, with that said, I'll leave you to um, a short presentation that you'll be offering up to our audiences on your recent exhibition at Cam Riley. All right, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm excited to be talking to you guys and talking to Taylor, and yeah, I'm really just excited to be here. And talking. Um, this project was one that came about back when I was taking art history courses in, uh, we're, I'm, trying to, I'm having a complete brain fart for a second. I went to school at UNC Greensboro for about two years and uh, that's when I majored briefly in art and uh, with a concentration in photography. Um, I was taking some art history courses there and um, I had just realized there was this lack of, um, there was a lack of black sitters, black, black subjects in the images and the paintings and the work that I was seeing. I decided that it would be interesting to not only make a project that was in reference to um, a specific time period, but also one that was in reference to, I guess, the lack of um, Black people that were in these images, paintings, sculptures, and uh, just being pictured. And I think part of that, uh, and it's not even a think, it's more, it's not even a thought, it's more so just um, the truth that a lot of people, black people weren't pictured at this time 
due to the subservient positions that we were kept in. Also, bear with me, I had a long day and I'm trying to like gather all the things that I know, I know, and kind of just present it to you. But yeah, so I started this initially when I was in college and I had this small image that I decided to do uh, back with a friend. Um, and but I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was like a hotel. It was this old Victorian hotel in Greensboro. And I showed it to the curator at CAM um, in Raleigh and he enjoyed it a great deal and decided that we're going to have a show kind of built around this concept of black people within this Baroque imagery. And I remember I found this woman when I went to the beauty supply store and I just thought she was so beautiful. Um, she had this vitiligo um, that was spread across her face and I wanted to go up to her, but I was really scared and I was like, okay, well, if I see her two more times, I'm going up to her. She passed by me two more times and I asked, could I, took her, could I take her picture sometime? It was just a matter of when I had a project that I felt that she would be really perfect for. And when Cam asked me what I wanted to do and I told them this, I felt like she would be perfect. And uh, I think another reason as to why I chose her was one, she's a black woman, but also I think, um, I think there was just something so beautiful about bringing in a person who doesn't have uh, the typical standard black skin. She has her own variation of it. And um, I think the way that her skin is, it just complements uh, so much of the styling, the leopard print and the hair, as well as um, the, the white collar. So I, really enjoy this image of Mariana and she resurfaces a couple of times throughout the project. And we can go on to the next image. So this is another woman that I ran into, I think because she was the sister of another subject. And I don't think I ran into her prior to the shoot. Uh, yeah, she was just a sister or a cousin of Chris, who I think is going to be in the same presentation. Um, but she showed up at the shoot. I told Chris to come and bring his friends or whoever it is that he wanted to bring. And I remember Tamika was at this shoot and she had just the most strong and beautiful face and her hair was cornrowed up into this bun. And I think since this was on a whim, I ended up just styling it myself, but I knew that I wanted the portrait to be very tight. So I pretty much just styled her from the, from the bust up um, to kind of make this side profile, almost bust-like image. And we can move on to the next one. Alrighty. This is a friend of mine, her name is Gemini. She's a DJ out in Durham, North Carolina. But um, she is just someone that I gravitated to mainly because she has this, um, it's not like, I just, I just felt like she really commands a room and I felt as though that's what I needed in an image uh, like this one, someone that kind of commands attention and you look, you have no choice but to look at them in their eyes or you kind of feel so intimidated that you don't. Um, I really enjoy this image of her. We did a couple of other ones that didn't end up in the project, but yeah, this one was one that I enjoyed in particular. Uh, one thing that I love so much about it is the hair. Uh, it was made by a, the wig was made by a hairstylist. Her name is Nikki and she's based in Raleigh, but I told her I wanted something that was super heart shaped and red, kind of similar uh, to what I saw in, I believe it was Alice in Wonderland. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I was wanted to go for with this image. Avante is someone that I ran into when I was at a bar and I just thought he had the most lovely and soft features. Uh, he has this like tattoo that goes across his eyebrow and I wanted him in a really, really, not a really long wig, but just one that is 
abnormally long and uh, I guess in a contemporary sense, but still references that um, uh, Baroque time period. I also wanted to include that chain going across the bottom because I thought it would be very fly um, and that fur coat. Uh, one thing that I think I was trying to do that I feel I was trying to do with the styling was not only reference this Baroque time period, but also do something, do some things that felt very contemporary. And I said fly before, but that's really what I was just going for. That um, that fur coat, it just feels very pimp-esque along with that uh, chain going across the bottom, I thought was really great. So that's kind of what I was wanting to do. And even this tattoo that's going across his eyebrow that I enjoy. And he has one that's going right across the bridge of his nose that I think is just so hot. So it was just, he just had these qualities that I felt could really make the image feel more modern, but still he has this timelessness to his face that I think is really great. This is Cassandra. She's a model based out of Charlotte and I saw her on Instagram and she has these freckles that go across her, the bridge of her nose onto her cheeks. And um, I, I'm trying to remember where we shot this. I think we shot this in downtown Durham and I set up a backdrop because I knew I wanted direct sunlight. And she, she just looks amazing. Her skin looks so great uh, with this styling. It was a slight nod to that group reference, but it was also something that I wanted to feel more uh, Renaissance and almost like a mix of a lot of things. Uh, and I just think she looks really great. I think another thing that I wanted to include was um, the large hoop earrings to still bring in something that feels a bit more modern and contemporary along with her box braids. This is, oh, actually this is um, the wrong name. I should have let you guys know, that was my bad. But um, this is Josh, he is my pastor's son. And I really wanted a teenage boy and I didn't know where to find one because, I mean, I graduated high school a few years ago, but I just don't know anybody anymore from there. So I asked my parents if they knew anybody. And she was like, well, my mom was like, ask Pastor Laney. So I asked um, Pastor Laney if we could use his son, Josh. And he was all right with, do with doing it. He's a teenager, so he wasn't particularly excited. And he was like, okay, this is very strange. And why are we in the middle of the street doing this? But um, he showed up to the, um, he showed up to the exhibition and he was really excited to see his photo blown up. But I think um, one of the reasons why I wanted a teenager was he just has this, you know, flyness that you get, that too cool flyness that you get from a high school student out in Durham. And even with that haircut, he has this like slight fade in this afro that I think would look really good with a collar as well as um, this uh, fur and this chain that appears again. This is Valentine. Um, I, I knew with her that I wanted to do something that had leopard print, leopard print. And I wanted the hair to be leopard print once again. And also I wanted it to match uh, this dress that she has on. I think the dress kind of, I remember how it looked originally and even the sleeve kind of reminds me of something that's very 80s. This whole outfit just feels very 80s to me uh, with the updo and the cheetah print and the, the um, like the collars on the hands as well as the jewelry, even the nails that are red and super, super long and these pearls that are coming down. Um, I feel like if there was, uh, if the Baroque time period was to happen in the, in the 80s, it would look like this. All right, so those are some of the works from the show. And Thank, you. Thank you for that, Kennedy. I know your schedule is crazy today, so I appreciate you um, grounding the conversation with that presentation. Um, also, I'm realizing there's such a like pedestrian nature to your work where you're like 
just organically encountering sitters that you're drawn to and then later you know it becomes formalized in this serial way um but i really appreciate that background of just like offering up how you come to these people how you choose sitters this initial attraction that you know gets you to the studio and engages these people um I wanna just backtrack and um, start the conversation just thinking about your Southern sensibility. You're living in Durham now, um, you grew up in North Carolina, but you also have family members that live in Louisiana and Texas. So you have a great deal of um, engagement with those sites as well. Um, and so I'm really, one of the first things that I ask in many of the interviews that I do is like, where are your people from? You know what I mean? And how do those origins really inform your work. So I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about the Southern sensibility that you've been so immersed in and how that informs your entire body of work. Yeah, so my father is from Philadelphia and my mother's family is from uh, Texas as well as they have roots in Louisiana. Um, my father's side, we're close, but I'm not as close to them as, um, as my maternal side. And we would be in Texas and Dallas quite frequently. Um, my grandfather, he's from Providence, Louisiana, which is where he was born. Um, I remember him telling me that his parents were sharecroppers and the reason he ended up leaving was this gets very dark but um, in his town they began castrating black men so his mother put him on a bus and made him go to the YMCA in, in Dallas and he stayed there and became a barber then he went to seminary and became a pastor to a church and my parents are well my father, he's a theologian, but my mom is also just, she's just a Southern black woman. <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe her. I think that's the best way to describe my grandmother as well. But um, they all had these really deep Southern black Baptist, uh, uh, black Baptist, not just Southern Baptist, because there's a difference, but mm -hmm. uh, just roots in that. So I think that's a great, it's a, been a great influence with who I'm most interested in my work, what I gravitate to the most, the subjects that I'm most interested in. And yeah, I think that's kind of just my, I think how my heritage kind of informs my work. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think also like, you know, just revealing the story about your elder who was essentially forced to leave the South um, just out of survival. I think so many of us have stories tied to that lineage where migration is often forced or instigated by terror and violence. Um, so speaking of heritage, um, you know, I wanted to call into this conversation, this idea of legacy and how it manifests itself in Black American heritage as opposed to other ethnicities and backgrounds. And I think particularly because Black Americans' engagement with colonialism, you know, forced migration, forced labor systems, so on and so forth, our, our inheritance isn't necessarily tied to like a monetary wealth or an economic wealth like some other ethnicities and ethnic groups. Um, but rather, I, I think, and I'll just speak from, from my experience, I'm often inheriting um, these more ephemeral things such as recipes or like a faith practice um, or the ways that um, you keep a home, right? Like these very mundane things. Um, but there's a lot of like wealth in those things as well. They might not be monetary or economic. Um, but I say all that to say, I'm, I'm really interested in just hearing um, if you have been able to mark the inheritances that you've received from your elders, um, biological or otherwise, and if those inheritances inform the way you make images or engage people for Im images. Hmm. I think I would definitely say 
food stories. I think I've inherited so many stories and just ingested a lot of the things that um, my grandfather would tell me, my mother would tell me, some things that would feel almost like gossip between family, but it's really just stories that are passed down. And sometimes they're kind of whispered in secret, but you also have the ones that people are very proud of. And I think that is something that just also informs who we are and who or how we show up in our families and how other people have showed up in our families. Um, I think, I'm trying to think of all the things. I feel like there's so many things that I learned from my family. I think spirituality is something that I've inherited from my family, given the fact that they're, I always make the joke that they're super saved. They're super saved, but I feel like my own spirituality has evolved from something that was, that they gifted to me. So I think there's so many things that I've learned from my family, but those are the few. Yeah, I think, you know, when I was, um, thank you for that. Thank you for that response. When I was looking at some of your images recently, it reminded me of this um, essay that's written by um, uh, Kiase Lehman, um, who's a Mississippian writer you're probably familiar with, um, widely regarded. Um, but he wrote this incredible essay on um, Outcast entitled The Art of Storytelling, but also embedded in the essay was this, um, this sort of celebration of his grandmother who worked in like a chicken uh, priming plant where she would literally like extract the insides of the chicken and it was a really messy and unglamorous job. But he talks about like how she would work all week to take care of him and to do this work. And then on Sunday, you know, like she went to church and she got clean, you know, like she got fly. And the the work and the labor throughout the week just became even more emboldened because she knew that like by Sunday, come Sunday, it's a holy day. It is it's my opportunity to flex on my friends you know, to show out for the Lord and whoever is in the audience and whoever is in my company. Um, but it was an opportunity to celebrate herself ultimately and something to like work up to every week. Obviously, um, Kiyase is a lot more elaborate than I am here. Um, I encourage the audiences, um, audience members to check out that essay. It's really beautiful. Um, but, you know, I think your series flexing as well as uh, this image that's up up right now with this young woman or this um, elder woman with this church hat, it just really signifies the ways in which Black people, um, you know, allocate space and time and resources to, to flex and to put on their Sunday's best, even in the wake of like really hard work or really trying times. Um, and so with all that said, I do want to uh, bring into the room your, your recent series that you remarked about earlier. And, um, you know, you mentioned that Flexing a New Realm, which is the, the, the title of the exhibition in the series, um, engages this history of Baroque 17th century European um, art history um, and depiction, which we can see here. Um, but you also create these like... Um, these juxtapositions between that history, that like European aesthetic with the more contemporary like black way of fashioning oneself. Um, and so I wanted to just ask, you know, what does flexing mean to you um, in terms of power, race and class and self-making? And also, you know, you, you described so succinctly, um, you know, having a vision for the type of like fabrics and fashions that you wanted to engage for this um, for these sitters um, deeply in influenced by their look or their personality so can you talk about the actual like um, the the focus um, and the process of like identifying clothing to really like mirror these these ideas that you were looking to invoke in the show um I think to start off, Flexing seems like one of those things that we have as Black people that we're able to control. And you're able to control your appearance at this specific time. And you're able to, I guess, in a world that 
everything, so many things are unknown. It's unknown what laws are going to be passed the next day. It's unknown just what unjustness I might encounter the next day. But if I have control over how I can showcase who I am in the world, I'm going to do that. I think mm -hmm. that's something that I wanted to do with this project, especially in reference to this particular time period, because there was wealth that was being portrayed during this time. It's, I think there was a level of, I keep using the word flyness, but I look good and everybody is going to know that I look good. And I, I think there was, there's an interesting connection to be made between um, control over appearance and how people perceive me. And I think flexing is all about a matter of perception. And I think that's what this project is about. Um, when it came down to a lot of the clothing that was decided on, I got a lot of help. Like um, the curator, I really think he should be a stylist on the side because he was styling a lot of this stuff. And I told him like, okay, I want this to also be in reference to, um, I guess like the baggy clothes or like the pimp nature of the nineties, or there's just different things from the eighties that I want to bring in as well, like leopard print. And he gave me the connections to the people to make the pulls and he helped me put a lot of this together. So it was just a matter of, I guess, being able to provide a historical context from the things that I've seen recently that are, that aren't necessarily more historical, probably just more contemporary fashions that I've seen in movies and in um, my community and people that I've been in connection to, or just like archival imagery that I've seen and ingested over time. And him bringing me that um, historical context and heart, art history context, but as I was building this project. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, another sort of theme that comes out of this work uh, for me, and I don't know if you discuss this with your curator, but you know, there's elements of camp in all of these images, right? And um, I'm specifically remarking the, on the discourse provided by Zora Neale Hurston, um, where she talks about the characteristics of the Negro in the early 1900s. Um, and I just want to like share a little quote there and then I'll follow up with a question. Uh, but in this essay, she writes, every phase of Negro or black life is highly dramatized. No matter how joyful or how sad the case there is, no matter how joyful or, or how sad the case, there is a sufficient pose or drama or focus on drama. Everything is acted out unconsciously for the most part, of course. This is an impromptu ceremony, always ready for every hour of life. No little mo moment passes unadorned. Um, and I really just appreciate um, that particular aspect of this sort of ideology of flex that you're offering up through this show. Like there is high drama, there's like an audaciousness that you're calling out that's so akin to a lot of like black American communities um, where no matter like, how little the resources or how great the resources, like there's always gonna be an attention to express oneself um, in distinct and unique ways. And I think your work really highlights that here. Um, I'm wondering like throughout, these are just like background images that I wanted to share just so people can get a sense of like all of the people that are engaged in the making of these images and, um, but I, my question for you is, um, you know, this show recently closed on October 3rd, I believe. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, if throughout the duration of the show, there was like any feedback that you got from audience, audience members that resonated with you. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I think, hmm. It was, a, it was a strange mix of feedback. It was uh, a mix of, it was more so like, oh, we should be proud to be seen this way. When I think not necessarily because I mean, there's a, 
I think there's a place that these sitters brought to the images, but in hindsight, I think I kind of glimmered over the violence that happened during this time period. And granted, these are really beautiful images and you, you get a sense of really just overall beauty, poisonous and strength through these photographs. But in the background, you have um, Black people being threatened to be deported from England during this time. You have the fact that they actually weren't even in these portraits during these, this time. So I think as I received that feedback, it's like, okay, this is really, you know, these are really great images and I'm glad that you guys like them. But I think um, as this project grows and breathes, I need to figure out a way that is not painful, but also brings this um, brings this into question, I think. Yeah. So it, I don't know, it just feels like my feelings towards it are a bit layered. And I think when I received the feedback that I received, that's when I started to reflect a bit more on how I was feeling about the photos in hindsight. Yeah, I think there's, um, obviously there's like a whole new discourse that's generated once the works are on view and you get people's interpretations of these things that um, I think artists might be very clear about and then they get a completely different response that isn't quite, you know, similar to the origin of what inspired the work or what prompted the work. Um, so I'm just always really interested in like how works are received and how the artist is taking in that feedback. Um, I think, you know, similarly, I, I appreciate you bringing up this, um, you know, this harsh, harsh reality of just like colonial violence that was very present during this Baroque period and continues to persist quite frankly um, with state violence, no matter where we are in the world unfortunately. Um, and so with that said, um, I do want to sort of move into uh, the exhibition that UCLA has offered up. Um, and this is, you know, why we're here, uh, essentially uh, celebrating the show. Um, but, you know, these are really fantastic and beautiful images that were created out of a really dark period of colonial occupation in Cameroon, right? Um, around the 1960s. Um, and it was the first time really that um, after colonialism uh, where Africans, uh, Cameroonians were able to fashion themselves and have, have autonomy over the ways in which um, they were being represented in portraiture. Um, and so I just wanna read a little bit of the curatorial statement here which says, selected from archival sources, the images reveal the dynamicism of the studio space where photographers took pictures for government mandated IDs as well as individual portraits of the same community members. The sitters themselves knew that by choosing specific types of dress, props and poses, they could reveal something of their cultural, political and religious affiliations. Uh, musical preferences as well, and important relationships, locations, leisure activity, activities, and more. Um, and I think you're, you know, obviously your work is functioning um, in a different cultural context and space, but I think so much of um, contemporary Black portraiture uh, has the ability to, you know, create some autonomy for the sitter, which I think is what you're doing in that series of works um, with flexing. Um, with all this said, can you talk a little bit about how you engage your sitters? Um, you kind of touched upon this uh, at the beginning, um, but I'm wondering what happens after you engage them? How do you work with your sitters to decide what will be signified in the image and allow them to feel comfortable in the process? I think, and I kind of mentioned this, but I always am just looking for people in passing and a really interesting face. It's kind of been more difficult with the masks and uh, not being able to see anyone's full mm -hmm. face. So I've kind of dialed back the amount of people I used to just walk up to. But um, I used to tell myself the worst thing that 
you, that can happen is a no. And typically a lot of people say yes. And um, depending on the project, like this one in particular, um, I would get their information. When the time came, I would ask if they were still interested, send them a little board of uh, just a summed up, you know, a bridge version of what I was doing um, with visual references and uh, just, you know, a brief blurb on what it is I'm looking to make. And they would show up. Um, I would ask them if they were, if they felt comfortable in their outfit and tell them prior that if you don't like it, if you don't like anything, you have room to voice your opinions. And even if you don't wanna say it to a room full of people, you can just have me come closer and just tell me. And um, that's typically how I went about it. And uh, I was, kind of sifting through the images and people didn't see their final image until they actually um, came into the exhibition. And I remember, um, uh, man, I should have included this image because he comes up so much, but uh, there was a man named Chris and he's very short, but we blew up the image to mural size. And I don't know, it was just so funny because he was so excited to see how larger than life he was. So I don't know, I feel like I have different reactions to various images. And um, yeah, I think after everyone got to see their photo, they were very excited about it. And I just sent them the images after. I wanna transition and talk um, a bit about your general body of work and particularly the way that you capture couples um, and intimate engagement between couples. Um, can you talk about your recent history with photographing lovers um, and particularly black lovers and the approaches you take to capture that intimacy in a really like authentic way? Yeah, sometimes the people that, or the lovers that I photograph, sometimes they know each other, sometimes they don't. And um, I think with the ones that don't, Sometimes I always end up getting the most chemistry out of the people that don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And I have them, I kind of open the space in the beginning to be like, hey, if anyone feels uncomfortable with anything, just let me know. Y'all can let me know. Um, and let me know what things you're open to do, what things you're not open to do. I have people that are open to um, being nude, someone that isn't okay with being pictured with another person nude. So I'll just kind of form the process around uh, the sitter's needs. So uh, it'll just be a lot of that. I think with couples, um, I don't know, sometimes they have, on camera chemistry that they're able to exude uh, when it needs to be exuded. Sometimes people just get a little shy. So it really depends on the couple. I think why I find it so interesting is uh, because, or a couple so interesting is because love is such a powerful thing. And I think when so many things are unknown in the world, it's important to have a space where you feel the most safe and vulnerable. And I think back on the times that I felt that way. And sometimes it's, uh, it's, those feelings have been platonic, but I think quite often they'll be romantic. And I take photos of self portraits of myself with my partner and sometimes he'll not want to, sometimes he will. So uh, I'll catch him on his good days and um, hop on it, no pun intended. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I love yeah. it. Um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I I feel it important to just know. Um, I'm being reminded of as you were talking about like this aspect of like vulnerability and intimacy. Of um, I think a mutual friend of ours, Texas Isaiah, was a photographer as well, contemporary photographer. But I think you know he as well as you and a few other photographers. There's just like a really uh, it's clear that there's like a really deep sense of care and awareness and ability to communicate with your sitters um, that's just so visible in the work and um, quite unprecedented, I have to say. So I really appreciate the ways in which you all are, you and um, 
your some of your contemporaries are able to communicate to your subjects and allow them to feel vulnerable and comfortable um, as they're being watched and seen. Like it's, it could be a really daunting experience. So I think that's a true skill, you know. Um, I'm going to move into the last question uh, before we open it up for audience Q and A. Uh, you know, since much of this conversation has been about flexing, I wanted to like highlight one of your biggest flexes um, in capturing Beyonce, arguably one of the um, greatest entertainers of our time, um, but more generally just focus on your commercial work and the work that you do with um, entertainers of this period. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, you work in both conceptual fine art as well as like commercial photography. Um, and I just wanted to pose this question um, to, to see if there is a way that either of those genres inform the other, um, if the conceptual informs the commercial or vice versa. And if so, how, how so are they informing each other for you? I think, I think at times it really comes down to a matter of subject and who exactly is being pictured or what group of people is, are being pictured as well as um, uh, I think it also can be a matter of legacy and what images that I would like to leave behind as a whole. And whether that be personal work or more commercialized uh, photography or editorial photography, I try to be as picky as possible when it comes to who I'm picturing. Photos that probably this, like this, would this image be uh, good for another person's visual legacy? And do I have an image in mind that could provide that? Um, I think uh, when it comes to my personal work, I'm kind of thinking within that same realm because you kind of, I kind of make so many photos. It's like, okay, which ones do I not mind being around when I'm not on this earth anymore? So I think those are probably the two things that kind of bring these two realms together for me. And I think in other ways, I'm still trying to figure out, okay, do I value one more than the other? Do you, I think that I will, you know, stop doing one and, you know, just pick one up, put one down. And it kind of fluctuates. I think, um, I think the two will definitely, be just a part of my visual legacy when I'm not alive anymore. That's a bit morbid, but that's kind of what I think about it when I'm, or think about when I'm choosing whether I want to do a project or not, or um, if I want to include an image in a gallery space or not, or if I want to just keep it to myself, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I don't think it's morbid at all. I think it's foresighted in ways that you need to be foresighted in this work. Um, I, I think previous generations haven't had the opportunity to think about a state building, things like a state building and how their work will persist um, or exist in perpetuity beyond their life. So it's great that you're thinking about those things in this moment. Um, I'm going to start fielding audience questions. Uh, if that works for you, please send your questions, audience members, to the Q&A um, portal uh, through Zoom, and I will try my best to get to them. Uh, the first question for Kennedy from Aretta in the audience, how did the subjects or sitters react to seeing themselves during or after the shoots? Were they emotional or reflexive? I think a lot of them were just excited to see themselves in really large images that weren't probably like it's I think a museum is typically where you do not see yourself and I think that can be something that is that can be in reference to blackness, but it's also on an everyday basis. You don't walk into a museum and see a picture of you, like actually you. And so I think that's what um, a lot of the reactions that I got were from. Um, due to the turnaround time, a lot of 
a lot of people weren't able to see their photographs in advance um, since I had shot it on film. So people were reacting, were reacting for the first time and they were really excited. So the second part to that question, um, Kennedy, what contemporary artists are you inspired by currently? Across media, it doesn't necessarily have to be fine art. Mm. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to think. Cause there's a lot of people, I'm looking over at my bookshelf now <laughs> cause to, to drive my memory. I know um, you mentioned Nina Lawson before. I don't know if that's yeah, relevant. I'm, but. I'm into a lot of her work. I remember early on, and still now, I'm really into Carrie Mae Weems' work. Carrie James Marshall, I'm into his paintings. Who else did I got on my show? Oh, uh, I remember I was really into Alex Soth, too. I like his mm -hmm. um, images. Sleeping by the Mississippi um, was gifted to me by my gallerist, and that's one of my favorites. And then uh, Susan Miala's. Uh, that's another book that was gifted to me by my galleries. And I've been really into her work as well. She has this um, really cool book that they gifted to me called Candy Strippers. Uh, it, it's called Carnival Strippers. It's called Carnival Strippers. And um, she would go to different carnivals uh, back in maybe like the 80s or the 70s and be at the carnival in the uh, exotic dancing section, section and take behind the scenes like documentary imagery. So it was, she has a lot of cool images in that book. Awesome. Um, so Melina Dodge asks, what is, what do you mean by flexing? Flexing, I feel like flexing is when you look good, you feel good, when you feel fresh, you got your new clothes on and you ready to step out. I think that's what flexing is to me. I think flexing is being able to be in control of how you feel about yourself, how you want to present yourself to the world and overall just being in control of your how you will be perceived. And I think that's a really difficult thing to, I think you can't really control perception, but I think flexing can almost be, someone could almost argue that it is the delusion that you have control over how the world perceives you and moving within that dream. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great answer. Um, Another question from Rose, uh, will Flex travel to other venues? I think probably. I think my gallery really wants to show it at some point. So we'll see. I think Rose is actually watching. So we can all see. <laughs> um, uh, Kurt Collins was asking, are you planning an NFT or any other alternative mediums for your photography? I was wanting to to do an NFT at some point, but then I started doing a lot of research and I was like, wow, this seems like a lot of work and a lot of things that I really don't know that I have to get right. Mm -hmm. So I just need to invest in my research as well as see the long-term effects of it. Because I was also like, okay, long-term, is this going to affect what work I can sell or if I can no longer sell it? So I think I am kind of, wanting to do it, but also wanting to see how it plays out a little bit before I really, I really get into it. Yeah, same. I think what I've learned is that like there is a new level of autonomy with artists where they can get money directly sent to them through these mm -hmm. unique NFTs. Um, but it's just too like the language is too esoteric for my brain that I'm just like, I'll come back to this later. Um, yeah, so. it, it always feels so convoluted. It's like, okay, this seems like the dream, but at what cost? Are you guys going to be selling prints of it? Like, what? I don't, I don't really know what exactly uh, yeah. it all entails. Yeah, well, good luck with your research. Oh, you and your gallery figure it out to take advantage. <laughs> um, last question. Um, Toby is, Toby says, I love the costumes shown earlier. What was the process of obtaining clothes for your models? Were they handmade, sourced, et cetera? 
So a lot of them were sourced um, through a vintage collector. I think their Instagram is House of Lander and she keeps all these clothes in her house and we just picked out the stuff that we wanted and made pulls. And then a lot of the accessories, we found them in thrift stores as well as Amazon. Nice. So, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, Bianca, if I could just say this one final statement from Sister Motique, I believe it is. It's just too pleasant for me not to read. She writes, I am so impressed and inspired by the two of you. Taylor, you and your intellect are just gorgeous. Kennedy, thank you for sharing your insightful process and capturing the best of who we are as people that is at all times unassuming, regal, and charming. Thank you, Sister Motique. Really appreciate that. Yeah. I um, completely agree with Sister's sentiment. Um, just thank you so much. First, I have to say thank you to the California African American Museum for making this program happen with the Fowler today. And then Kennedy, you know, I got to thank you, of course, for joining us. Your work is just so powerful and seductive and striking. And we're just so honored that you shared more about um, your process and your inspiration with us today. And Taylor, of course, thank you for your insight and the way in which you guided this conversation. Just a huge thank you to you both for the careful thought and consideration you put into today. Thank you, Bianca. And thank you to my colleague, Alexandra, who collaborated with UCLA to promote this program. I appreciate my staff at CAM. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Yes, thanks everyone for joining. This program has been recorded. It's available immediately on the Fowler Facebook for you to revisit and share as you see fit, but it will be on the Instagram accounts and on our websites next week. So look for it then. And uh, Fowler, we hope that you guys will join us for our next program and you can find information on the closing slide. In the meantime, have a great night and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. you, Kennedy. Thank you.